<laughs> okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Monica Vazirani for her second lecture in this workshop. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I probably have other announcements I was meaning to say, but I can't even remember what they are right now. So, um, right, so what am I talking about um, today? Um, I'm going to be talking about induction and restriction. Um, essentially, there are, there are a lot of questions to, to really look at induction. And the, there was a problem in the problem sessions, but we didn't have that much time to get through it. So I'm going to do a problem very similar to the one suggested in the exercises. And you can have a chance to do a similar problem if you want. And um, right, so the interplay of induction and restriction and uh, maybe some uh, combinatorics and counting at the end. So, okay, so induction. So when we're talking about induction, at least for finite groups, in what induction does is you have to use this tensor product. I have a, a group G and a subgroup H and I linearize them. I turn them into vector spaces or rather I turn them into algebras by just taking linear combinations of them and using distributive law to multiply. And then if W is a vector space that H acts on, I form this tensor product, okay? And I'll remind you, what does it mean? Um, so we, we said if you take the tensor product of two vector spaces, then to get a basis of it, you could take a basis of one of them, let's say Wj's, and a basis of the other, so like say element sigma and g, and just put a little symbol between them. And then they're a basis, so you take linear combinations of them. The fact that we have the subscript of CH here means that we also have an extra relation that we put in, which is that when we have um, G times H, simple tensor little w, and H happens to live in the subgroup H, then we get to have the H jump over, whoops, that's okay. We can jump over the tensor to the W. And then because we're starting with W being a representation of H or C of H module, the H knows how to act here and turn it into some other vector, which then of course you can express in that original basis. Okay. And so that's what we do for induction. Now, if we, um, so on the one hand, um, ah, so because we have this relation, if we want a basis of this tensor product, this relative tensor product, then we don't wanna put all elements G here, we want to put elements I called sigma i. And where did the sigma i come from? Well, we already said the wj is a basis of w. The sigma i are a set of left coset representatives for h and g. And that makes sense because if the h's get to hop over and get absorbed in the w, you only need to understand g's up to right multiplication by h. And that's what cosets do. Okay, So they're just a system of coset representatives. Okay. And so um, then if you think about it, the dimension of this space, you don't just have the dimension of W, you multiply by the index um, of G and H, because that's how many representatives you have here. And then it's useful to order um, your basis so that everything that starts with sigma one comes first and everything with sigma two comes next and so on. And so just as a vector space, this tensor product, you can chop it up into say R many pieces if R is the index. And this, I just put a simple plus here because this is not as representations, this is just as vector spaces. Okay, so let's get our hands dirty with this vector space. Well, also, how is G supposed to act on it or linear combinations of things from G? Well, G knows how to multiply the sigmas and then we use this relation to sort of turn everything back into linear combinations of our chosen basis. All right, so let's do an example um, together uh, in some amount of detail. And you might've already done this example. And feel free to work ahead and solve it before I get there. So let's take the symmetric group S3 as our G and our subgroup, this parabolic or Young subgroup calling S21 which is isomorphic between S2 cross S1. So it means, well, I get to move around one and two and I get to move around three, um, right? And so um, let's see. All right, and I'm gonna take, uh, what do we need? We need to find coset representatives, 
right? We need to decompose G into um, left H cosets. And we ask ourselves, how many are there? And so we say, well, um, this group has size two factorial, one factorial, and this group has size three factorial. So there should be three cosets, right? Whoops. And yeah, sorry. Right, there should be three cosets, okay? And let's explicitly, if you want, you can write out the elements of H, right? They're the ones that are only allowed to swap one and two with each other and well, swap three with itself. And another way to think of this um, subgroup, which is sort of useful, is that they are all the permutations that don't move three because you know three is a singleton all by itself. Okay. All right, so we've got these three cosets. So the number three here appears in many places and most of them are coincidence to each other. Or actually, no, I take that back. They're not all coincidences. They're all the same three back in this example. Um, so, uh, right. So let's pick some coset representatives. Well, there's a really nice way to pick coset representatives out of all the choices out there. Um, I chose the ones that happen to be of minimal length. And possibly later in the week, there'll be some exercises about doing that and thinking about the combinatorics. We'll kind of see an example coming up of how to think about minimal length left coset representatives. But here's the three cosets. And one thing that's nice when you have a, a group acting on a set, um, you, it gives you a nice way to realize these cosets when we have um, the subgroup realized via this action. So if H is the subgroup that stabilizes three, it makes sense that this coset here, well, what does this coset representative do? It sends three to one. So everything in H will send three to three and everything acts, you know, things that act on are living over here. And then this representative, it sends three to one. So every element in the set will send three to one. Likewise, every element in this coset will send three to Two, and our identity coset, everything in H, we already said are the um, things that said three to three. So we have these three cosets, one, two, three, and good names for them might be one, two, and three, because that's where they send the number three. All right, so these are our cosets. And if we're going to try to figure out um, how G is going to act on an H representation after we induce it up, we're going to have to understand how elements of G intersect, interact with these coset representatives. So given a permutation in S3, I call it tau, for each of these representatives, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, um, so, uh, so if I call this guy sigma one, this guy sigma two, and this guy sigma three, I have to figure out well, when I multiply each of them by tau, it lands somewhere in G and G is a disjoint union of the H cosets. So that means I can, there's some other coset representative I can put in front of it and some other element for my subgroup H. And of course, what, this, what J you get and what element of H you get here totally depend on the tau you start with and the I you start with, but it can be found, okay? And so, all right. Now that we've laid out that framework, let's induce a representation. What representation should we pick? Well, in the first example, let's just keep stay on the left side of the page. Let's just start with the trivial representation, okay? So by the trivial representation, I was using this notation, this bold one earlier. And so what does that mean? It's a one-dimensional vector space. This is called the basis W. And everything in H acts trivially. And our, again, our H is 2, 1. So H, W just equals W. So if we had to attach a matrix to H, it would be the one by one matrix, one. Okay, so, or sorry, yeah, for all the H's, it would be the one by one matrix one, which I'm not going to write that down. Okay. And now let's pick a particular tau. And let's see how um, tau acts on our vector space that we get from inducing our W. Okay, well, we have to compute this data of how it interacts with coset representatives. So we have to figure out what's T tau times sigma one, tau times sigma two, and tau times sigma three. Going through those calculations is something um, you can do on your own, but once you figure it out, 
it's sigma one times this element in H that's swapped one and two, but it happens to send sigma two to sigma three and sigma three to sigma two. Okay, but again, you never know when an H is gonna appear on the other side. All right, and so now let's, um, uh, write out um, what is happening on our basis, okay? So I'm sorry that I am not kind of writing on the tablet that much in real time. I have it more written down in advance because I didn't trust myself to remember how to do any math in the morning. Um, okay, so now, only after you figure out what goes on with the COSA representatives, in other words, you look at basically how they're permuted up to some you know, fudge factor, now we can take these representatives and put our tensor WJs, put our basis here. And we only have a one-dimensional space, there's only one W. And so we input the information from our computation above over here, and we say, okay, tau sigma one, right, this some other sigma times this extra, possible cost from H, and then my W sticks behind. But now this lives in H. In case you forgot what your H was, that lives in H, which was our S21. And so the relation is it's allowed to hop over the tensor. And why do you want it to hop over the tensor? Well, you wanna do that because you wanna express things in your original basis if you're about to write a matrix for it. And then this is a trivial representation. So in fact, we could have just never computed the fudge factor, but we might need it for other representations. I mean, H of W plus W. And then for the rest, we go back to our computation. You can still see at the top of the screen, um, since tau sigma two is sigma three, we get sigma three tensor W here. And since tau sigma three was sigma two, we get sigma two tensor W here. And now that I have this information, I don't need to get scrolled off the screen. And now we're ready to write our matrix given that we order our basis in you know, this way. And so remember from linear algebra, how you write a matrix then, right? So since it sent the first basis vector to the first basis vector, my first column here is one, zero, zero. It sent the second basis vector to the third, and it sent my third basis vector to the second. And here's my matrix. Okay, and let me remind you what was tau tau was the permutation one, three, two, which happens to swap three and two. And notice this is a permutation matrix that swaps your second and third standard basis vector. And in fact, um, we do get a permutation representation. And you can sort of see why, if, you, if it's totally new to you, you might not see why, but it is a permutation representation because um, when you act on, these coset representatives, right? You land in some other coset and this fudge factor from H that might or might not pop up never matters because it's the trivial representation. All that matters is how the cosets are getting permuted around, right? So this really is when you induce the trivial representation, it really is just the permutations representation that you get from acting on the cosets. And so that means the matrices we're gonna get are all gonna be permutation matrices, right? So that's a fairly um, concrete example. And right, let me just remind you, right? So we have these three cosets and what did tau do? It fixed the first coset and it swapped the other two. And I didn't pick these names just arbitrarily. There's a reason why um, it's the first and the second and the third coset. And tau was this permutation that fixed one and swapped two and three. So for this particular subgroup in SN, you can cook it up to always look like that. But there's many other permutation representations and then you will associate different matrices to your different elements of the symmetric group. All right, so just to make sure that we really understood what was happening, let's scroll back and say, wait a minute, what if it wasn't the trivial representation? What if for this S2 cross S1 being my H, I picked um, the permutation representation so that my um, so that my two one three element in H, my non-identity element in H, uh, 
swapped W1 and W2. Okay, so it's a little permutation matrix corresponding to 0, 1, 1, 0 in that basis. Okay, so on my two dimensional space. All right, well, I get to reuse my computation here and figure out what's going on. But now this factor will matter. So for instance, now when we do tau sigma one tensor W one, and it becomes sigma one tensor, oops, one three W one, now I look back to how did H act on my representation? Oh yeah, that non-trivial guy swapped W1 and W2. Okay. And similarly, I have sigma one tensor W2 will get sigma one tensor W1. In other words, we get this block matrix dividing up our vector space as we said to above. And instead of um, right, having just a number here, just the one by one matrix one, which was how H acted on the left-hand side, my little H acts by this permutation matrix on the right-hand side, and that belongs there, okay? Now, if I go to fill in the rest of the matrix, um, I can use the same computation. And so you'll have a little identity matrix here, and you'll have a little identity matrix there because there's no fudge factor to swap around your W1s and W2s. But the global structure of it looks exactly like this, except that, right, instead of being one by one, all of these little blocks become two by twos. And where there's non zero entries here, you get little matrices. But all of these others are going to be all zeros. And so I'm not even going to write them in, I'm going to leave them blank to denote that they're all zeros. Okay, so I invite you in the exercises to practice with a different tau um, in case that was new to you. There you wanna get your hands dirty with induced representations. All right. So, um, ah, to talk just a little, to try to kind of draw a picture diagrammatically of, of what happened and what's going on with these induced representations um, and kind of with these coset representatives, you think to yourself, I, you know, I have a representation, whoops, W, that's being acted on by your subgroup H, and then anything from G wants to come along and act on it. And that gives me a new module, right? W is an H module. Now I've sort of built up this tensor product, this bigger module that anything from G wants to come and act on well, right? So something from G comes and acts, and then it gives you some new representative up here. Potentially things fall into H and they might mix things up in W. But in terms of your basis that you're picking, your coset representatives, let's draw a picture of minimal length coset representatives and kind of why. So let's take a bigger example. Let's take n equals eight, right? And suppose my subgroup was S332 and there's some W being acted on and I wanna have my tau come and be say this diagram here, okay? Well, if you think about it, Anything in S332, you get to permute around the one, two, three, you get to permute around the four, five, six, and you get to permute around the seven, eight. And you might as well make life easy for yourself then. And that means you can absorb the crossings that hit this subgroup and you can undo those crossings. And if you think about like smoothing out this crossing because it's coming in here, and if you want, you can smooth out that crossing. Um, what you're left with after you take away those crossings is a permutation where the only crossings that happen are from because of strands that cross these three, three, two walls. Okay, so hope maybe that resonates with you in the picture, maybe it doesn't. Um, if you are not good with topology, like I'm not, you could algebraically, if you wanted to write what was the list notation of that permutation, I think I have it written here. And then what is this? smoothing of it, this getting rid of the crosses, or rather, we're, in other words, what is the minimal length coset representative in its coset? You just draw the three, three, two lines, 
And then you rearrange the one, two, four and increase the four, one, two, you rearrange an increasing order. And the seven, three, six, you rearrange an increasing order and you have five, eight, and that's the end result. And I leave it as an exercise to you. If you had multiplied on the other side, um, if the H had been on the other side of this permutation, it would have resolved different crossings. And then the pattern you would have gotten here would have looked a little bit different. Okay. All right. So now we've done a concrete example of induction. So let's look at, so we learned that we should look at morphisms. Okay. So let's think about if I have my induced module, one of the ones above, now it's now S3 knows how to act on it. It's a representation of S3. So let me look at morphisms, S3 morphisms from this induced module to some other representation of S3. Okay. Now, um, well, if I have um, such a homomorphism, right? I have to tell you where everything in the basis goes, but it also has to play nicely with the action of S3. Um, so if I look at all of the simple tensors of the form identity tensor WJ, or maybe WJ comes from my basis, each such one goes to some vector V. But remember, I said that these are S3 homomorphisms. And so if you remember what it means to have a module homomorphism or a map of representations, right? You have to intertwine the action of the group, right? That means that whether a sigma from S3 acts on something from here before you apply your map F or after you apply your map F, you should get the same thing. And that's true for every sigma in S3. And so that means that if we know where identity tensor WJ goes, to be a module homomorphism, we know where every sigma tensor WJ goes. It has no choice. It has to go to whatever sigma would do to V on this side because V is also an S3 representation. So this is my sigma jumping back and forth over my app. And of course, jumping back and forth should remind you a little bit about when we have these relative tensor products. Okay. Ah. And also, um, right, I wrote, because it's not just an S3 module to see a joint S3 module, F is also going to be C linear. It's gonna be a vector space map. All right, so this is forced. And so in other words, I just need to know what you do on the simple tensor starting with the identity and that determines everything. Um, but there's constraints, right? Remember that my relation to this relative tensor product are that elements from H, well, H times identity is H, they get to hop over the tensor. And so that means that, right, I can't just send this anywhere. Wherever I send this identity tensor WJ in here, that map all by itself, ignoring the identity, has to be an H module map. The H has to right, play nicely with it. And so that means that, let me shrink down so you can see a bit. So my homomorphism here is completely determined by what it just does on W. And then because it's only H's that are interacting, it's really looking at the restriction of V from G to H. And so any map here, the information of an S3 module homomorphism of my induced module carries the same information as just an H module, a C joint S21 module homomorphism or representation map from just W to restriction V, okay? So this fact, and I say carries the same information for us once, they're actually isomorphic as vector spaces. Um, and depending on your situation, maybe they're isomorphic as more, depending on what extra structure these HOM spaces might have, okay? But so, yeah, these HOM spaces are going to be the same as vector spaces, isomorphic as vector spaces, the same dimension. And again, this is my um, induced representation, okay? And so um, this fact, that I have induce on this side and I have restrict on this side and I get to stick in you know, a V and W and have something, you know, this guy hops over to this side, just like we had with an inner product. When we say that these functors are adjoint, this is what we mean, that they're adjoint with respect to um, this, these HOM functors in these relative settings, okay? And so induction is the um, adjoint functor to restriction. And I can never remember if it's left or right when we do it this way. Because to me, I'm like, 
well, this guy's on the left here and this guy's on the right here. So who decided to call this the left adjoint versus the right? But I think it's the left adjoint. Okay. Um, all right, so there were some questions about that. Um, and so hopefully this explains a little bit of why, um, or sorry, sort of what it is to be adjoint functors, but also why it makes sense, okay, that you can actually see this relationship happening um, in practice. Okay. And so also if um, you want, there's this advanced exercise from yesterday, which might get repeated today if you, if you missed it to look at um, this relationship further. Okay. Now, um, so also another nice thing that this means is that if you prefer one functor or the other, um, you can live in one land or the other. It says, you know, if we understand restriction completely, say for the symmetric group, then that means you also understand induction completely. And hopefully we'll get a chance, at least combinatorially, to see that in action and what I mean, what I mean by this in action. Um, sorry to interrupt. Hi, please. Sorry to interrupt, but could you go over the diagrammatics of induction one more time? What did you mean by smoothing out? Oh yeah, absolutely. So this picture here. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I said smoothing out. So what I mean is you. Um, so an one some element in S332, right? They get to move these around in any way you want. I guess I really mean undo the crossing. So here's this, um, right? So here's this crossing. And it's um, you know, as I or let me actually, sorry. So let's say, you know, I've written my diagram super well so that it's not ambiguous at which level each of these crossings occur, although to the naked eye, they, a lot of them look like they're the same height. But if I do that, maybe this one looks like it's the lowest crossing, right? But this crossing lives in my S332, so I'm basically allowed to undo it. I can just act by the permutation that undoes that. And when you do that twice, right? So if you do a permutation twice, it's as though it's not there at all. And so you can kind of think of it as that, you know, you have this crossing and you, you know, you've kind of um, smoothed it out. <laughs> That's what I kind of meant by smoothing it out. Well, yeah, but technically what I really meant is compose it underneath with the correct permutation that lets you pull the strands apart. All right, ah, okay. So if you've taken some representation theory classes, you might've done things with characters, groups. I haven't said much about characters yet. Um, I'll say a little bit, only a little bit here and, and maybe more as the week progresses. But if you've seen characters of representations before, you might've seen this adjointness of induction and restriction on the level of characters. Um, and they might've even called it Frobenius reciprocity when you learned it, which is, there's something called a character of a representation. You get it from taking traces. And so if V and W are your representations, they have characters, you know, chi V and chi W, and there's a pairing on them. And there's a relationship that if you do the pairing in G of an induced character with something else, it's the same thing as if you pair with respect to H, this character and the restricted character, okay? And this looks just like our jointness that we see on the level of home. Okay. And that's not a coincidence because these characters and this pairing are measuring home. Actually, you're, if when you're pairing the character of V and the character of W is giving you the dimension of the home space. Okay. And so um, again, if you haven't seen characters before, I don't expect you to understand the slide, but many of you have, okay? And this is tying things together. And I'll just remind you that um, chi v of an element b is the trace of the matrix you get for how g acts on v. So you, you know, pick your favorite basis, turn it into a matrix representation. If it wasn't that already, that has a trace. That's a number. That function that assigns that number to g is called a character, character of v. Okay. 
And I'm not even gonna remind you of the formula for the inner product, but it's the one that works that actually measures this dimension. So, ah, so now something that might occur to you, and I made this kind of big deal about right versus left. And um, if you learned about Frobenius reciprocity and you've seen this pairing before, it was a symmetric pairing. It doesn't care if you do, um, you know, chi V paired with chi W or chi W paired with chi V, if you remember the formula. Um, but wait a minute, that should say the dimension of this Hong space, it shouldn't care. And that should worry you a bit because, um, wait a minute, you know, you have, like if you think about groups, right? And you think about like, home, like you know, take, you can have a homomorphism from Z to Z mod three Z, but you can't have a homomorphism from Z mod three Z to Z. Well, at least not a non-zero one. And so why should you be able to do Homs backwards and still get the same thing happening, the same number of maps? That should worry you. But in this situation, because we're dealing with, you know, um, complex numbers and finite groups, you're okay. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time um, to go into uh, that right-left symmetry, like some sense of why it's okay um, to be able to swap these two factors and get the same amount of homomorphisms there. Ah! How do I go back? Okay. Oops. All right, so um, I could get there fairly quickly, but I'm gonna get there rather slowly because it's a chance to remind us of some good representation theory to Schur's lemma, which despite only being a lemma is like really um, quite a nice theorem. Um, so the general setup of Schur's lemma is, okay, I can start with actually any ring I want, but Let's let a ring be a C algebra. In fact, you might as well be thinking for the sake of this week, it's just the group algebra of a symmetric group, okay? And M can be any, uh, say left, how about left, A module. Um, and again, that just really means it's a representation of your symmetric group. It could even be a permutation representation. Um, it's a vector space that SN knows how to act on. All right, so M is any old left A module. But let's say V is a simple left A module. Simple, in other words, irreducible. In other words, if we're in this setup, it doesn't have any S3 invariant subspaces. Okay. And now three things are true about homomorphisms, A module homomorphisms between the simple V and this M. So if I look at a map that goes from V to M and respects the A action, Either it's identically the zero map, meaning you know, f of v is equal to zero for every v I pick in. Another way to say that is the kernel of my f is v. So either the, my f is zero, meaning v is the full kernel, or f is injective, meaning it has no kernel. And uh, the reason why either or has to happen is that the kernel would be a sub, an invariant subspace of v, and v doesn't have invariant subspaces. So kernel has to be all or nothing. Likewise, if a map goes the other way from M to my V, since the image is a submodule, the image has to be all or nothing. So again, either F is zero or F is surjective. And so if I take a homomorphism from V to V, now both sides are simple. I apply one and two to V, and that means that either your map is zero or it's invertible. So in, uh, in ring speak, that would say that the endomorphisms would be a division algebra, okay, or division ring. All right, and so if we're in the setting that we're working over the complex numbers, so we don't need to deal with any number theory because we're algebraically closed, and we're working with um, finite group, um, then this endomorphism space, it has no choice but to be the complex numbers, okay, the ring of complex numbers. This endomorphism are um, rings. And sorry, it's trash day. So if you hear really loud banging in the background, I'm sorry. 
All right. Um, okay, so Schur's lemma, because um, right, we, we had this talking about homomorphism. Um, let me remind you one great corollary that comes from Schur's lemma is that, okay, so if I have my simple A module, my simple representation of G, and I take something in the center of the group algebra, then it has to act as a scalar on V. In other words, if you um, were to turn it into a matrix, it would be a scalar matrix, all right? And what is the center? Let me remind you um, that the center are the things that commute. So the center of A are all the Z and A that Z commutes with everything in A, okay? And again, so by scalar matrix, right, I mean something like four, 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 something like that, four times the identity. I don't mean a diagonal matrix, I mean a scalar matrix. Um, why does this follow? If it's not clear to you, you don't remember, you can do it in the exercises. All right, so let's put this to work and see how it's gonna um, help us think about our right left symmetry a bit. And also say, well, we're gonna use some properties that we're working with finite groups or other complexes. Um, all right, so some examples. All right, so let's say my algebra was just T itself and my representation is one dimensional, right? What are the homomorphisms? C homomorphisms from C to C, linear math from C to C. It's just C, it's the ring C. Again, complex numbers. But what if I put this two dimensional vector space and this three dimensional vector space here and I say, what are the C homomorphisms there? Right? Well, vector space maps from C2 to C3, you know, what's going to take you from a two by one column vector? to a three by one column vector, well, a three by two matrix. Okay. okay. Um, and what about going the other direction, right? Going the other direction, what are the homomorphisms, the C homomorphisms that take you from C3 back to C2? Well, those will be two by three matrices. But guess what? As vector spaces, two by three matrices and three by two matrices are both six dimensional vector spaces over C. They're isomorphic. So yeah, they're totally different maps going back and forth. But um, you know, at the expense of transposing, you can uh, set up a nice isomorphism between these spaces. Okay. Um, so, all right. So let's go back to our setting that I have a group algebra and a simple module, right? So what can we say about the homomorphisms from V to V? Well, if you recall what we learned from Schur's lemma, that should just be C. And it was no problem at all to see this top line here, that the C linear match from C to C is just C. But this situation, the A the homomorphism from V to V is also C in this situation. Okay, so what's going to happen if I take direct sum of two copies of V versus direct sum of three copies of V here and I look at the A homomorphism? For the same reason that you get three by two matrices here, you're going to get three by two matrices here as well. Okay, because you know you have so many choices of where the two copies of V go into those other three copies. Um, and so that means that in the same by the same reasoning, whether we're going from two copies of V to three copies to three copies back to two, we don't care. We're going to get the same homomorphism space just like we did over here. Okay, I said it's exactly the same, but of course our brains can wrap around this much better because we've taken linear algebra classes or taught linear algebra classes. So, um, all right, also, right, just to make it, I'm, so I'm work, getting, working up to this right left symmetry, right? So let's say I have my simple module V and I'm looking homomorphisms into something that I was able to decompose. It has my three copies of V, but it has lots of extra junk, you know, an X, two copies of Y, 14 copies of Z, and X and Y and Z are some simple 
A modules, but none of them are isomorphic to B, right? So by Schur's lemma, you know, I'm not gonna have any maps from V into X, but I'm gonna get these three maps from V into these three copies of V, okay? And same thing here, if I have taking homomorphisms the other way, all that matters is that there's three copies of V on one side and one copy of V on the other side to get this dimension. And so this right-left symmetry, um, part of why it's happening is because, um, let's see, let me leave a little space here and say what's happening, right? That C of G is what we call semi-simple, the semi-simple ring. And so all of its modules are completely reducible. In other words, isomorphic to the direct sum of simples with some multiplicities. And in this case, there were some questions about this. In decomposable and simple become the same thing in this setup. And so that means that when we're looking at these HOMs, right, left versus left, right, it's not going to matter. Okay. This doesn't have to happen in general, but it does in our setup. Okay. And so again, we have this right, left kind of symmetry going on with HOM. And so that means that even though as I set it up, induction was left adjoint to restriction, it's going to become the right adjoint too. You can swap things on both sides. Okay. Um, all right, so looking at the time, hmm, okay, so, ah, yeah, let me, um, decategorify this situation a little bit, and this is related to characters, um, all right, so in this setup, right, where we're talking about SD's range of modules, Go for it. Question. Um, in this setup where G is finite and we're working over C, so we're in semi simple land, um, we might want to say, okay, I have my C of G, I join G modules, and maybe I should put some adjective like finite dimensional or finitely generated there, but let's not, let's take all modules. And let's, Instead of talking about V, let's just think about its isomorphism class, which will denote by putting brackets about it. Okay. And so let's make some target space that I'll call K naught of this category be well, generated by these isomorphism classes of modules with the relation that if I take the direct sum of two modules, um, I want to say that's the sum of these two symbols, the class of V and the class of W, which makes sense. I mean, that's basically. Yeah, direct sum behaves just like addition, but this here is a class of module is a category of modules. This thing on the right hand side is what we call the growth in group or the split growth in group, and it's a Z module. And so I've replaced um, something more complicated with something easier. That's you know decategorification. All right, and why is it a Z module? Why isn't it a monoid um, when we have say G just being the trivial group? And we said, okay, well, then we've just got C modules, we've just got vector spaces, right? We saw, um, we've seen earlier this week, I guess that means, oh, on the weekend, right? That if you take vector spaces and you take isomorphism classes, then you're just replacing it with the dimension, more or less, and that's just the monoid N. So how am I getting Z here? Well, I'm just decreeing I'm making it the Z module. So I'm like formally throwing in minuses basically, okay? Um, just because we want it to be the growth and deep group, not the growth and deep monoid, okay? And again, a Z module is an abelian group. Um, okay, so if we do this, um, you know, we replace modules by their isomorphism classes and we have, you know, we can take these sums of them. In other words, what, what Z module is this? Well, it's going to be a free Z module in other words, a free abelian group. And of what rank? What's the basis? What generates this? Well, I can just take the indecomposables, which happen to be the simples. Okay, they're going to be a basis, right? So it's like saying, scroll up a bit, you know, like I had 
you know, this creature here, I was able to write it as three copies of V, some X, two copies of Y, 14 copies of Z, with all of these guys being simple. And so it's basically saying, look, we can do this with any module, and then we can replace it with, you know, three times, um, right? You replace it with, you know, this corresponds to three brackets V, you know, plus X, plus two, the class of Y, plus 14, the class of Z. And then I'm just working in a Z module where I have just these linear combinations, these Z linear combinations of these, you know, bracket symbols. And that's just this free abelian group on whatever symbols I have available. Okay. Um, all right, so, so doing this is a very natural thing to do in our setup because this is how our modules are behaving anyway. Uh, but it turns out it's a nice thing to do with a more complicated category as well. All right. So given that the simples are forming um, a basis of this free Z module, we might want to understand our simples better for the symmetric group. And I think with this audience, a lot of people understand a lot already about the symmetric group. But let me um, look at things, um, dial things back and say, um, you know, where does it come from? A lot of you already know how to parameterize the simples, but, um, you know, why does it work? Um, and, and it works so well. And I don't think I'll have time to get into all the ways it works so well, but let's see. So for me, it has to do with the center. And we've seen the center came up before when we're talking about Shur's lemma. So what is the center of the group algebra of SN? So it's different from the center of SN. We get a lot more when we go to the group algebra. And so an exercise that you can do um, this afternoon, if you want, so take something in the group algebra that's in the center. So it's a linear combination of um, permutations, or you can take a more general group here. If it's in the center, these coefficients are constant on conjugacy classes, whether it's the coefficient of G or the coefficient of HGH inverse, you get the same coefficient. In other words, if I were to make the function from g to c that sent g to this coefficient ag for the central element, that would be a class function. So a class function, it's a function on g, constant on conjugacy classes. Right, this is what I mean by conjugacy. All right. Where have you seen class functions before? In characters, in traces, right? When you take trace of two matrices, the trace of a, b is the trace of b, a or if A happens to be invertible, right? The trace of A inverse BA is the trace of B. It's an invariant under conjugation. Um, so when you have a representation of a group, which you've set it up as a homomorphism from G to say D by D matrices, and then you take the trace, that is going to be a class function. And that is what characters are, All right, They're class functions. So, Class functions that you've come to know from representation theory as traces from representations, class functions also arise naturally thinking about the center. And to me, they're the same thing. So, right there. So to me, they're the same thing. So that means characters um, are basically the same thing to me as um, the center of the group algebra. And ah, I should have said, oops, Darn. When we were decategorifying up here, right? I could have, if I had instead taken a different, um, if I had instead gone to the land of class functions by sending V to its character, that would be, that would do basically the same thing as this decategorification here because the characters are additive when you do the direct sum of representations, that the character of V plus W will be the character of V plus the character of W, because when you have a matrix and you stick them together with zeros in between, you take the trace, right? The trace is additive. Sorry for that detour. All right. So that means that Wait, how big ask, is this? Sorry, question? can I ask another question? Please. So to your comment just right now, why then do we take the growth and deep group and not the growth and deep ring? Oh, well, 
we can take it, but I didn't want to talk about the ring structure on it yet. I was going to leave that for um, maybe Katarina to look at. <laughs> yes. So it is the growth indie group, but depending on where you start, it might not just be a group under addition. It might also be a ring or it might also have other structure to it. And so depending on what category you start with, when you um, take the growth indie group, it might actually be a growth indie ring. And, and it is. But I, I just wasn't ready to talk about the ring structure yet today. All right. Um, okay, so I, so the dimension of the center of the group algebra, the symmetric group, or you know any group, it's the number. It's going to be the number of conjugate classes of S n, right? Because we said those coefficients there they're constant on conjugacy classes, and so you can pretty much see that the bump functions on conjugate classes are a nice basis for the center of the group algebra. And what are the conjugacy classes of SM? They're really nice. They're just indexed by cycle type, okay? And cycle type, you can just um, associate that to a partition, okay? But that's, that's not a big line here. I think that most of us knew that partitions parameterize um, the simple modules of the symmetric group, up, but you might not have um, thought about it, the dimension of the center of the group algebra, okay? So for example, so cycle type, right? So the, the two cycles in S3 are one, two, two, three, and one, three. And so any linear combination of them that is constant across this conjugacy class, that's gonna be in the center. And here I've written them out in this notation. Okay, but as much as we were doing list notation yesterday, if you're talking about conjugacy um, and the center, you really wanna use cycle notation. And so this one, two, it's a two cycle and there's kind of a one cycle. There's a hidden like three that's being fixed here and a one that's being fixed and a two that's being fixed. So if you keep track of all of the cycles, the cycle type of the transposition is really two one. And this is how you associate partitions to conjugacy classes. Um, fact about centers, centers of matrix algebras are just the scalar matrices. And again, not the diagonal matrices, it's, you know, because diagonal matrices don't, com they commute with each other, they don't commute with everything. Scalar matrices. And so um, it's also a fact that if you um, take a group algebra, you can rewrite it as a direct sum, of, a direct product of matrix algebras. Okay. And if you don't know why, I'm not going to teach you now, but it's true. And it has to do with the fact that we're semi-simple. And so that means the center of our group algebra, which we already understand in terms of conjugacy class sums, is also a direct product of centers of, centers of matrix algebras. So just a bunch of products of scalar matrices, a bunch of copies of C, and a partition of N many worth of them. And this has some other basis, the basis that looks like the 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 in this respect to this decomposition, which is totally different from the conjugacy class sum basis there. And let me just skip ahead in the interest of time that if you were to ask, what is the change of basis between the two? You would roughly, up to some constants, recreate the character table um, of S3. So you've probably worked with character tables before, but you might not have thought of them as a change of basis matrix between two different bases of the center of your group algebra. And I, I just think whether um, yeah, I think what I'm gonna do is just skip ahead to my last topic. And then depending on what kind of questions you ask in Slido, I can um, come back and fill in some of the details I'm flying through at this part or not, if we're happy to skip over and not return to it later. Okay, which is um the partitions, and thanks Zaj, who made this picture for me. Um, so the partitions, um, I, I drew this partition for cycle type before. Um, you can arrange all the partitions of N, for N being zero, N being one, N being two, and so on, into what we call Young's lattice of partitions um, in this way. Okay, so they've been drawn at each level. Um, and so you could think of these as listing all the conjugate classes, but um, 
for deeper reasons, it's listing all of your simple, all of your simple modules. Oh, that's what I didn't say. Did I not say that? Sorry. Um, I went through all of that to convince you that there were as many simple modules as kanji classes. And I think I just, I skipped over that when I looked at the clock. So I really should come back to that. And I might have to leave this counting exercise for the next time. Okay. So, um, right. Going back to this idea that this group algebra decomposes its matrix algebra, you know, matrices basically only have one representation. They just act on column vectors, one simple representation, right? Five by five matrices act on five by one column vectors. And that's basically it for their simple module. And so for each of these factors, you build a simple representation. And that's really where they come from. You decompose into matrix algebras of size one and one and five and seven. And that means you have a one dimensional, one dimensional, five dimensional, seven dimensional representation. And this is where we come, they come from. And so that's how many copies of C that you have over here. Okay, that's the size of this kind of basis. But as we said, it's also the number of conscious classes. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons that partitions index, index are simple, okay? And one thing that's really nice about this basis on this side is they kind of detect, if you have written everything in your symmetric group in terms of, as in the center in terms of this basis, they really detect these simples. In other words, this will act as zero on every simple except for the one that um, matches with its lambda. And right, these guys, it's easy to see they sum up to one, 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 which is the identity. And you multiply any two of them together and you get zero and you multiply it by itself and you get itself back. So you get these set of complete minimal orthogonal eigenpotents that, um, right, so on your, um, they act as identity on sort of their representation and zero and everything else, okay? So this way of looking at the center um, behaves really nicely um, with representations. Okay, I ran out of time for doing my counting on Young's lives, so we'll have to do that next time. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, that was a great talk. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Um, any questions? Um, sorry, I just missed it. I think you had uh, just on the previous slide, you had these five. What was the five on the previous slide? Oh, it was just a random coefficient. Oh, okay. I was just showing that um, as long as you're constant, right? As long as you're constant, it'll be in the center. So most people would just put a one there. But I was like, you can put, you know, you could have put I everywhere as you, if you wanted. Yeah, or so for, for another example, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, right? So this guy here, right? It has one on all of this kind of class, or let's look at this guy, right? There's one on this kind of class, there's negative one on that kind of class, and positive one on that kind of class. That tells me that this linear combination is in the center. Oh, and I lied. It was actually negative one sixth on this class and positive one sixth on this class. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions you would like to ask now? Let me remind you, as Monica said at the beginning, there's the Slido um, board so you can post your questions there as well, if you'd like. So we can address them either in the exercise session or um, during the next lecture. All right, well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Monica again.